In this unit, we're going to talk about something called a polynomial function. And ironically, we're actually going to leave out what polynomials are until the next lesson. Uh, today, what we're going to do is cover something called a power function, which is actually just a simplified version of a polynomial function. And we'll see how they're related tomorrow. But for now, all I can tell you is that these are the easier way to start. So that's what we're going to do. So you've seen all kinds of functions before, and you have seen power functions and polynomial functions. In fact, uh, in one of the previous uh, lessons we did, we talked about how area, for instance, area of a circle can be written as pi r squared, or we could write that in function notation, area at r equals pi r squared. That actually is an example of a power function. All power functions have the form of f at x, and again, the variables we choose can change from situation to situation. Here we're using f at x, generic x, generic f for function. Uh, the ones we just did was an r because the radius was the uh, thing that matters for figuring out the area of a circle, and a obviously was for area. But any power function is going to be of the form f at x equals some number, which we're just going to call a, and a can be anything. It can be a positive, a negative, a whole number, a decimal, a fraction, doesn't matter. And then it's going to have a, a variable x to an exponent n. And the x is going to be an x, or again, whatever other variable for our area of a circle, it was an r. And the n is just going to be some natural number. And a natural number would be like the counting numbers 1, 2, 3, etc. These will not be fractions or partial numbers. There'll be no decimals in the exponent. It'll have an exponent of 1 or 2 or 3 or 4 or 5 or something like that. When it comes to looking at these, and you know what, actually I'm going to put, put this, like bold that out a little bit to really draw home. That's what all power functions are going to look like, just a number, x to some exponent, or a number, some other variable to some exponent. And we can make a whole bunch of graphs with this. So the first thing I want to talk about is just the degree and the name of these types of functions. And when we get to polynomial functions in the next lesson, we'll see how we can kind of build on the same terminology and these same ideas, uh, but with just a slightly more complex uh, equation. So if we start off with something like y equals a, remember that a is just any number. So this could be y equals uh, pi, like it is in a equals pi r squared. It could be 7. It could be 23.2. It could be 5 halves. Uh, but this is going to be a degree 0. And the degree of a, a power function is basically just a fancy way of saying, what's the exponent on the x? Now, what you might be saying is, wait a second, y equals a doesn't have an x in it. And the fact that it doesn't have an x in it means it's really x to the exponent 0. And that's why we say it has a degree of 0. You'll see that degree makes much more sense with all the other uh, exponents on x as well. OK, so this is actually going to be a linear function, but we can be a little bit more specific. And we can also call that a constant function. Now, it's a linear function because it will form a straight line if I graph it. But that line will actually turn out to be completely flat. It doesn't get bigger as we move left or right. And because of that, we say it's a constant. And it makes sense. If y equals just a number, it doesn't matter what x is. y will always be that number. So this is basically a special function where it's saying it doesn't matter what the input variable is. The output is always a. Now, y equals ax, the degree on that is 1, because the exponent on x is 1. Technically, oop, there's a weird little blip there. Should just be 1. And anytime there's not an exponent on something, it's automatically assumed to, to be a 1. So this would be a linear function as well. Uh, we would not call this one constant, because the value of y does change as x changes. If a is 5, then y is 5 when x is 1, y is 10 when x is 2, and so on. y equals ax squared is degree 2, and we call those quadratics. Uh, just in case any of you are thinking, I thought we called those parabolas. Parabolas is actually the name of the shape of a quadratic function. So the name of the function is quadratic, the name of the shape of the function is parabola y equals ax cubed. Now, these ones you may not be as familiar with, but you may have heard the, the terms before, or at least uh, you can kind of accept them. Um, for the exponent of 3, we call that a cubic, which is why we usually call it, you know, y equals something x cubed. That's three-dimensional. Three dimensions, 3 is the exponent, so we call that a cubic function. 
and a degree 4 function, y equals something x to the 4, we can call a quartic. Now, anything bigger than that, if n is greater than 4, what do we call them? Uh, there are names for all these. We could call them quintics and sextics and septics and doctics. Uh, you know what? I'm not even sure if those are the correct terms anymore. They're the proper prefixes, I think. But uh, usually we would just say, um, like, for instance, if I have y equals ax to the 7, I would just call that a degree 7 polynomial. I wouldn't worry about a special name for it. I just refer to it by number. And if you ever forget the term cubic, you can just refer to it as a degree 3 polynomial and, and so on. It's not a big deal. All right, end behavior functions. This is basically just a way of describing what the function does as we look at it from left to right. And I will point out that we're going to do kind of an easy version of end behavior now, and we're going to be a little bit more specific about it later. I will do an example of both today just so you can see it, and uh, we'll, we'll explain later why we need to use the more complex or formal version. But for now, the easiest way to describe this one is um, if we move from left to right, always thinking of the left as the start and the right as the end, I, I noticed that this graph here is going down as I go towards the left-hand side, and it's going up as I go towards the right-hand side. So I would simply say that this starts low, ends high. And for now, that's a perfectly valid way of stating the end behavior of that function. And even if you closed your eyes and just pictured a blank graph, if I said a function starts low and ends high, you kind of know where it starts down in the bottom left, and you know that it ends somewhere in the top right. Now, a more formal way of saying this, and, and we'll again come back to this later, when we need to get a little bit more formal because our starting and ending high and low won't quite, quite, it, uh, won't quite cut it anymore, um, what we would say is, as x goes to negative infinity, so that's a fancy way of just saying x goes to negative infinity. So basically, we're just saying what happens as we go over in this direction. And we see that y goes down. So we would say as x goes to negative infinity, y goes to negative infinity as well. And the other way around, if the x is getting larger, we can see that the y is also getting larger. So we say as x goes to positive infinity, y goes to positive infinity. And that right now is how we would formally state it. Uh, but again, we're not going to worry about that. The start low, end high, perfectly valid for what we have to do at the moment. It's just a matter of um, we need to save that other notation for later when things get a little bit more complex. For this next part, we're going to kind of go through Desmos really quickly to see what happens um, when we kind of go through all these different possibilities. So we're going to start off with y equals x, y equals x squared, y equals x cubed, and so on. We'll do it up to 6 just to kind of see if we see a pattern. And then we'll see what happens if the number in front is negative. In fact, we'll see what happens when the number in front is any number of things. But we'll, we'll kind of take a look at negatives at first. OK, so over in Desmos, I'm going to put in here. Now, I, you'll notice on the paper I put down y equals x. And that's what the graph looks like. There's no difference between using a y and f at x. The graphs turn out to be exactly the same. Uh, I just wrote y on the paper to, to use regular notation instead of uh, function notation. It doesn't really matter which one we use. I'm going to actually leave it. I yeah, no, let's go back to y. That's what the paper uses. We'll try and match it. OK, so before I do too much here, um, y equals x is, is pretty boring. And I'm going to get you to fill in your paper, even though it's not visible on my screen because I've got Desmos up. But for this one, we have it starting low, ending high. Now, if I put a number in front of this, and let's say that I change this to a 2, it still starts low and ends high. If I change it to a 3, it still starts low and ends high. So this doesn't seem to matter. It still has the same end behavior if I put in different numbers here. In fact, even if I put in a really big number, like 100, um, it's a little bit harder to see this way. But if I zoom out a little bit, 
you will see that it is actually starting low <laughs> and ending high. It's just very, very close to being on the y-axis. I'm just going to click the home button over here. It just kind of takes us back to the default size scale rather than trying to zoom to the right level. So the number in front doesn't change end behavior at all, sort of. Um, you'll notice that the second column, we see what happens when a negative goes in front. So when I put a negative here, it actually flips the graph completely. So instead of starting low and ending high, it starts high and ends low. So a negative in front, a negative A value is going to flip that. And again, if we change that to at a different value other than negative one, we change it to negative two, it still has the end behavior of starts high, ends low. All right, I'm going to go back then, and we're going to change this to y equals x squared. And there's the parabola that you all know and love from grade 10. And the end behavior on a parabola like this is going to be starting high, ending high. And if we throw a negative in front of it, it will start low and end low. So you'll notice that the negative side in front just reverses what the end behavior will be if you know what the end behavior is for the positive version of it. So I'm going to leave off the negative signs for a little while and just go through the other powers. If I go to power 3, an exponent of 3, you'll see it starts low, ends high. Well, that, that's exactly the same as what y equals x did. So an exponent of 1 and an exponent of 3 have the same end behavior. What about an exponent of 4? Okay, that looks kind of parabolic. It's not actually a parabola, and it doesn't look exactly like one. It's a little squared at the bottom. But it is similar to a parabola in the fact that it starts high and ends high. So an exponent of 4 on our power function has the same end behavior as an exponent of 2. Changing it to a 5, we start low, end high. This looks a lot like the cubic, the y equals x to the exponent 3. So you'll notice that we have the same end behavior of start low and high for y equals x to the 1, y equals x to the 3, and y equals x to the 5. All the odd numbered exponents have the same end behaviors, start low and high. And then finally, we can kind of predict this, I think, uh, y equals x squared was like a parabola, y equals x to the 4 was kind of like a parabola, y equals x to the 6, kind of like a parabola. So it starts high and ends high. And again, putting a negative sign in front of any of these just changes the behavior completely. So instead of starting high, ending high, it starts low and ends low. And that's pretty much it. So from there, we can start to make predictions about other things. So going back to our original sheet, um, you will have filled this table in. I'm not going to worry too much about it. What I want to do, though, is see if we can use our knowledge that we just learned to predict what this graph is going to look like. Now, that graph there, if I asked you this at the beginning of, of uh, class today, what that graph would look like, your brain would probably pop and, and you'll bleed out your nose a little wee bit. But now I think we can kind of see what we need to see. All we have to really do is look at the exponent on x and see is it positive, or sorry, is it even or odd? And then look at the number at the beginning and say, is it positive or negative? So the odd number up here tells us that it's going to normally start low and end high, much like it did with y equals x, y equals x cubed, and y equals x to the fifth. And the negative sign there is going to reverse. So anytime we have a negative sign, whatever was high becomes low, whatever low becomes high. So the odd exponent says start low and high. So we're going to predict that this is going to start high and end low. Now why don't we go back to Desmos and actually plug in that exact function and see what it looks like. Okay, so let's go replace this. We're going to type in negative 28.6x to the exponent 163. And wow, that looks it looks really sharp, actually, at these, these corners. And it's because any number that's less than 1 to a really high exponent, like if it's a fraction, just keeps getting smaller. The bigger the exponent gets, it gets smaller. 
Uh, and anything that's bigger than one gets much bigger when it's put to a high exponent. So it stays really close to zero until right at the end, and then it just jumps and goes up really quick. Now, just for interest sake, and, and one of the properties we should notice for all polynomial graphs, and again, power graphs are just a special example of this, is that if we zoom in enough, we should see that this isn't a sharp graph. It's always going to be actually kind of smooth. We just have to get in close enough to see that smoothness. You're never going to get a polynomial graph that has anything sharp in it. It just doesn't work that way. Okay, so the important thing here is that we were able to take a look at a function, in this case a power function, but we'll be able to do the same thing with polynomial functions after tomorrow's lesson, and predict kind of what they're going to look like based solely on the exponent on the x and whether or not the leading coefficient is positive or negative. That actually is a fairly powerful thing to learn from just so little information to know what the graph would look like. All right, continuing on to the next idea in this lesson, we're going to talk about the domain and range of a function. Uh, I'm going to be honest, the domain and range of a function, this applies to all function types, not just polynomial functions or power functions, but this seemed to be a good place to put it in, mostly because power functions is really a short lesson. Uh, we're going to have to talk about it eventually, so this, this just seemed a, an appropriate place to do it. Okay, so um, what is the domain and range of a function? The word domain, um, these are going to have to do with the x and y values. And if you've ever heard the old saying, like a, a king or a queen uh, looking over their domain, their domain is horizontal. It's the ground. Uh, kings and queens don't look into the sky for their domains. That would be the y-axis. Domains are flat, so that's going to be our x values. And domains are all possible x values. And again, just a reminder, the x values are our inputs into our functions. And that our range, as you may have guessed, is going to be all possible y values, or outputs that we can get. So really what we're just stating is what values can we possibly plug into the function and what values can we possibly get out of the function. There's a couple of different notations here that we can use. Um, which one you use is kind of up to you at the, the moment. We're going to kind of go through the course and see when some might be better than the others, but for now it doesn't really matter. And I will point out that a couple of the functions that we're going to do are power functions. Um, actually, that's not quite true. Um, we'll see why after tomorrow's lesson. Despite the fact that first ones look like parabolas, they're not technically power functions because they don't go through 0, 0. They actually have a little bit of a, an extra term on them, but it, it doesn't matter what they are. All, it cares, uh, all we have to care about today is what the picture looks like and understand what the inputs and the outputs are. So looking at this first picture, and I'm going to point out that just because of the drawing program that I used to make these, which is Desmos, uh, that's how I make these pictures, it, it doesn't include these little arrows that should go on the end of these to suggest that the graph is going to go on forever and ever. But we're going to make the assumption that when a graph goes off like this, it's going to kind of keep following the pattern it was, was going at before it left. So assuming this is true, we know the end behavior of this particular one starts low, ends low. Um, the domain is what possible x values could we plug into it? Well, looking at that, it looks like all possible x's are there eventually. I mean, technically, it only goes up to about here to here before it leaves the graph. But we know afterwards it's going to keep going on forever and ever in both directions. So what we can say here is just um, x is the element of real. And don't get too caught up on the notation. Uh, this is basically a fancy way of saying x can be anything. That thing in the middle looks kind of like a, uh, an E, but it's rounded instead of squared. It's just a symbol used for element, and we could talk more about that if you just ask me. And then uh, the real number set just says it, it basically can be any number, positive, negative, decimal, fraction, doesn't matter. And it, a weird thing we do in math, and I'm not sure where the origins of this are, number sets tend to have this double vertical uh, bar in them so that they represent sets. If you don't want to do the double bar, you just write down x, e, r, for x is the element of real. That's just fine. But if you like the fancy notation and the fancy drawing, by all means, feel free to do so. Now, the set notation is, can we say kind of what the min and the max are? 
So the way that I'm going to draw this one is I'm going to put down um, that this one basically can go from negative infinity up to positive infinity. Now I want to point out that this is not an ordered pair, like it's not a coordinate like you would see if you're graphing a point. It's just saying the minimum is negative infinity and the maximum is positive infinity. And if there's a boundary on those, like an actual number, then we put a square bracket. Um, infinity is not an actual number, so we use a round bracket. And we're about to see an example of, of this in just a second. So basically this says we can plug any x in we want and we'll get an output number. And for the range, it looks like the biggest I can possibly get is right here. My y values are always going to be below that point, which is 3. So for inequality notation, what I would say is um, y is the element of real, just to tell us that it's a real number again. And then to be more specific, y is less than or equal to 3. So y can be 3 or less. I'm never going to get an output that's bigger than 3. And the graph is pretty clear. You're never going to tell me what, um, what output uh, or what input I give it to get an output of 4. It's always going to be 3 or lower. So here, the smallest value we can get for y is negative infinity again. And the maximum we get is 3. And because 3 is actually a precise number and it includes 3, 3 is a possible answer. I'm going to put a square bracket on it. Again, don't get too caught up on this domain and range notation. I'm more interested that you understand the basic concept of it than the notation is proper. We'll keep working on notation as we move through the course. Okay, so here's a very similar one. Here we have um, another parabola. It starts off low and gets, I'm sorry, it starts off high and ends high. Um, I was about to say it basically just opens up. So it has a minimum overall. The minimum is right there. And much like the, the one above it, um, x can be anything. So it can go from negative infinity up to positive infinity. And for the range, we can see that the y values, the outputs, have to be greater than or equal to negative 2. There are no parts of the graph that are below that. So we say that y is the element of real. And then we're specifically going to say y is greater than or equal to negative 2. So again, minimum, oh, I wrote too quickly. The minimum is the precise value of negative 2, so I put a square bracket. The maximum is positive infinity, and infinities get the round bracket. All right, we are getting closer to the end. This next one here, uh, it's actually a square root function. We don't see them very often, but that's what it looks like. It's uh, kind of like a sideways parabola, but only half of one. It doesn't have the other half of the parabola. If it did, it would be on the bottom. But for that, that doesn't matter. All that's important here is that we can figure out what the domain and range are based on the picture. And here, x, there are no x values below this point. There's nothing over here. Everything is on that side. That value is negative 3. So we would say that x is the element of real. x is greater than or equal to negative 3. And again, the x value, the smallest we get is negative 3. The biggest we get is infinity. So it looks like that. This one, y is the element of real and the restriction on it. The smallest it gets is negative 4. And then it keeps going up and up and up forever. So we'll say y is greater than or equal to negative 4. So the smallest number is negative 4, the largest number is infinity. This last one is a reciprocal function. It's basically a polynomial divided by a polynomial. That's more than we need to know right now. Again, all we need to focus on is the picture. We don't need to know what it's called. And it looks like I can put in any x value except x equals 2. At x equals 2, there is no graph. It, it goes down really far close to negative, or sorry, close to positive 2. And it comes very close to the right to positive 2, but it never actually touches positive 2. 
So what I'm going to say here is x is the element of real, and x is not equal to 2. And for set notation, this is where set notation isn't as pretty, is that when we've got these breaks in it. So set notation would be, um, it goes from negative infinity to 2. And you notice I'm going to put a round bracket on the 2, and that's because 2 is not included. It's getting close to 2. It's 1.999 is fine. But 2 itself doesn't actually count. And then we're going to continue it from 2, which is the new minimum of the second piece, up to positive infinity. So now you can debate which method you like better, the inequality of the set notation. It really doesn't matter. But I think what you'll notice is that in some cases it's easier to do the inequality notation, and in some cases it's easier to do set notation, which is why there's two different ones for us to use. The range, the range is very similar. Um, the only y value we can't possibly get out is 1. There's no input, or there's no output of 1 no matter what our inputs are. So that means that y is the element of real such that y is not equal to 1. And then we just do it this way. Negative infinity up to 1, but don't include it. And then 1 up to infinity. Again, if you're a little bit confused by the domain and range stuff, don't be too bothered by it. It's something we're going to kind of keep talking about as the course goes on. So if you're stuck with it, it's we'll, we'll figure it out eventually. All right, one last little thing, and this is pretty easy to do. X-intercepts and Y-intercepts. An x-intercept is a fancy way of saying what are the valid values, uh, sorry, what are the places where it crosses the x-axis. So we often just write down x-int for x-intercept because we're lazy mathematicians. And it's uh, places where we cross the x-axis. And I'm going to note that in all of these, y value will be 0. Uh, because if we're not on the x axis, if we're off the x axis, y would be positive. If we're below it, it would be negative. But right on the x axis, y is 0. And then the y intercepts, obviously, are places where we cross the y axis. And that will occur when x is 0. Because we're not in front of the x or behind the x, we're on the x equals 0. So we're exactly on the y axis. Okay, so the intersections of these. I'm, I'm going to point out that there's actually kind of two ways that people represent these. Some people represent them as ordered pairs, and I believe that's the way the web page does it in our D2L. Uh, however, we only actually have to list the number itself. So the x-intercepts on this first graph, and I'm going to zoom in on this, I think, just a little bit for these because we can. So the x-intercepts, there's one that occurs here and one that occurs here. Those are the places where it crosses the x-axis. And those values are negative 1 and positive 3. Now, you could also write down the coordinates negative 1, 0, and 3, 0, remembering that the y is always going to equal 0 for the x-intercepts. But honestly, my preference would be just write down the actual numbers, the places where it crosses. But be aware that the other notation is used. OK, and the y-intercepts on this one, there should only ever be one on a function. Because again, if there's more than one on a function, it means that an input of 0 is giving more than one output, which is not function behavior. But our x, or sorry, our y-intercept here is right there. So that would be uh, negative 2. And again, or you could write that as uh, 0, 2. The x is 0 and the y is 2. As far as I'm concerned, that one's perfectly good and easier to write, but I won't consider the other one incorrect in any way, shape, or form. OK. These next two, we'll try to do pretty quickly. Here are the x-intercepts. There's one right there and one right there. So I'll just write down x-intercepts are negative 2 and 3. And the y-intercept is down there at negative 3. Easy peasy. 
This one, which is starting to look a little nasty, but will become like old school to us by the end of the unit. It's got an x-intercept there, right there, and another one there. So the x-intercepts are negative 3, negative 1, and positive 1. And the y-intercept is right about here, and I believe that's a 2. Or at least close enough to 2 to my eye that I'm not going to worry if it actually is a decimal or a fraction. Okay, so x and y-intercepts, pretty straightforward. Nothing too tricky there. Um, before I leave you here, I'm going to point out that in D2L, underneath this actual lesson, there's a, a little thing that says online resource. It actually says 1.1 online resource, I believe. Um, and if you take a look at it, it, it kind of walks through some of the ideas here, but it has some online interactive activities that you can try. So it'll ask you some questions. You kind of try and answer them in your head, then you click on the button and see if you're right. So that would be a good way of practicing this. And if at any point you're not sure what to do or you don't understand, just ask and Ed will try and help you out. All right. Uh, if you've got no questions, well, not that you can ask them because this is a video, but uh, give that a try and let me know in class if you have any problems.